Hi everyone, welcome to Chapter 1, Introduction to Tax. Just quickly before we start into taxation, during this semester we will be focusing on taxation of individuals at the federal level. So federal personal income taxes. We'll be introducing you to the various law and the forms used to report information to the government on the tax return. So let's get started. In chapter one, we're looking at generally what taxes are. So you get your feet wet a little bit. We're gonna demonstrate how taxes influence basic business, investment, personal and political decisions. What constitutes a tax and the general objectives of taxes? Why do we have them? Describe the different tax rate structures. That's something special we used in order to calculate a tax. And identify the various types of taxes at the federal, state, and local level. And the last thing we're going to look at in this chapter is how to apply appropriate criteria to evaluate your alternative tax systems. So who cares about taxes? And if you're following along in your book as well, that's the first objective we'll be looking at. Who, ex who cares? Everyone cares. <laughs> Businesses especially. A business will worry about taxes because different types of businesses are taxed differently. So how um, should they form as a business? Should they be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, a corporation, a special type of corporation, a limited liability company? So businesses, before they pick their ultimate form, We'll look at the taxes associated with, with each. Where should the business locate? Now, we're going to be focusing on federal taxes in this class, but states have taxes and local governments have taxes. So a business is going to look at those tax taxing authorities as well to see where do we want to go? How should business acquisition be structured? How should we buy the, the business if we're buying one? so that it has the lowest tax implications. How should the business compensate employees? How much? What kind of taxes are associated with that? Some more questions they, they worry about. What's the appropriate mix of debt and equity for the business? Should the business rent or own its equipment and property? What's the tax implications of each? And how should the business distribute profits to its owners? There's tax implications there as well. So as you can see from a business perspective, there's a lot to worry about when it comes to taxes. And these are just some of the questions that are asked and, and the tax implications are then looked at. Here's more information. Who else cares about taxes? Well, individuals, we don't even have them here, but individuals, you and I, beyond being a business, are worried about our taxes. We care about them. That's money we have to pay out of our pocket to sustain the government. Speaking of government, politicians, they office distinct, often distinguish themselves from one another based on their tax rhetoric, what they say about taxes. And there's a great um, taxes in the real world, Republicans versus Democrats on page 1-3 and their perspectives on um, you may know from your own experience uh, on politics is that Republicans are for less government, so that means less taxes, lower tax rates. Democrats are more for a more centralized um, government involvement, and so that takes more taxes to run the government. So voters must have basic knowledge of taxes, to evaluate the merits of each tax proposal. And we're in an interesting time right now um, where there may be some major tax changes. I'm waiting because for the past eight years, we had a Democrat president and they're usually the ones who start the process of tax reform. And now we have a Republican president with a Republican controlled Congress. So I see major tax law changes occurring. 
which we're going to talk more about in the next chapter. And there we are, the individuals. Why do individuals care? Like I said, we have to pay taxes. <laughs> it's part of our everyday life. But some questions you may ask yourself as an individual, should I rent or buy your home? Well, there are special tax incentives for people to purchase a home. They get tax deductions for home mortgage interest and real estate taxes that they pay on their home. That could reduce the after-tax cost of owning a home. Would you like to retire? You have to look at the tax advantage of saving for retirement now for your future and how it will be taxed. Those are just two little areas. So yes, individuals worry about taxes. So we, we took a little look at who cares about them. And, you know, we can talk for uh, a couple hours or days even about who cares about them and the different types of tax. But just to give us a flavor of this is why we're here. Now, what qualifies as a tax? A tax is a payment required by a government. So it could be federal government, state government, local government that is unrelated to any specific benefit or service received from the government. So you're not paying the government for to get something back from them. It's just a funding source for the government so they could provide whatever benefit or services to whoever. You're not getting it directly. Key components in calculating a tax and, and part of a tax, the payment required, the payment imposed, by the government agency, whether it be federal, state, or local, and the payment is not tied directly to benefit received by the taxpayer. So those are the components of a tax. You got to pay it, it's imposed by the government, and there's no direct benefit you will receive. So let's take a look. At an example here, what, what are we talking about? Which of the following constitutes a tax then? Well, payment for your driver's license. Well, let's say you pay, you're paying the government, usually the state. It's payment that's required to drive, but you're receiving a benefit, the right to drive, right? So that's not a tax. That's a fee. Payment for required by government house appraisal. Again, going through. Is it required? Is it, yes. Is it a um, an amount you have to pay to the government? Yes. Are you getting a benefit of it? Yes. You're getting an appraisal of your house. Payment for a hotel use of 1% of bill to pay for city projects. Ah, payment for use of a hotel. So it's a payment. It's going to the government. Is it benefiting you directly? No. You're not getting something directly in return from that tax. You're getting a lot, you're using the hotel room. That is going to pay for city projects that will benefit a whole bunch of people. So that's considered a tax. A payment for the rental car use of 3% of bill to pay for fixing of the roads. Again, it's a payment required. It's being paid to the government, but the payer is not receiving a direct benefit out of it, like you would from a driver's license fee or um, the house appraisal fee. It's going to general uh, road maintenance, that tax. So that's what makes it a tax. So now that we know who worries about tax and what is a tax, let's take a look at how to calculate it. Sorry, I'm kind of drinking coffee and um, <laughs> doing this at the same time, so bear with me. This is Learning Objective 3. To calculate a tax, you need a couple key components. First of all, a tax base. And the laws define what is actually taxed as a tax base. So the tax base is um, defines what is actually taxed and is usually expressed in monetary terms. The tax rate is the level of taxes imposed on the tax base and is usually expressed as a percentage. So to calculate the tax, you'll take the tax base, what is being taxed in terms of money, times the tax rate, a percentage defined by law 
that you apply to the tax base. And you could think of this if you, um, a common thing that we all have to deal with is sales tax. The tax base is how much you're being charged for a particular item. Let's say you're in Pennsylvania and you go and you buy a purse. Purses are taxed, sales tax in Pennsylvania. You buy it for $50. Well, the tax base is $50. Then we say, well, what's Pennsylvania's sales tax rate? Well, they have a flat 6% sales tax rate. So 6% of $50, or if I'm doing it in my head quickly, $3 <laughs> is the amount of sales tax. So this tax computation is generally done across the board for different kinds of taxes. I just gave you an example of sales tax. Now, there's different types of tax rates. What I gave you was what we call a, a flat tax, a flat tax of 6%. There's what we call marginal tax rate. The tax rate that applies to the next additional increment of a taxpayer's income. So when we start talking about income tax, which is a tax on what you make, your income, which is what the federal government taxes individuals on. That's why we call it an income tax. We don't all pay the same percentage um, of tax on our income. Again, our tax rate is not the same across the board like it is for a sales tax. We have what's called a, a progressive, an in incremental tax rate. As your income gets higher, the amount of uh, money that you, the amount of, I should say, yeah, the percentage of tax on certain amounts of money will increase. So, for instance, not everybody pays a 10% income tax. On the first level of income, certain dollar amount, they may, temp may pay 10%. But as their income increases, so will their tax rate. So what a marginal tax rate is, and you'll, you'll hear people refer to it, oh, my tax bracket is 20% or 25%. They're talking about their marginal tax rate. That is what their next dollar of income would be taxed at, the tax rate. The average tax rate is different. The taxpayer's average level of taxation on all of their taxable income is their average tax rate. So if we had a flat tax rate of 10%, your average tax rate and your marginal tax rate would be 10%. But because we go in increments based on income, your average tax rate will tend probably to be lower than your marginal tax rate because now you're averaging all of your income to your taxes. The effective tax rate, the taxpayer's average rate of taxation on each dollar of total income both taxable and non-taxable. In this situation, what they're saying here is we say, okay, we figure out our tax on income that is taxable, which by the way, not all income is taxable, which you're going to learn this semester. We're going to divide that, um, our tax, by all of our income for the year, let's say, whether it's taxable or not. That is your effective tax rate. So we have different ways to measure tax rates. Marginal is what we refer to as my tax bracket because that's how much uh, your rate will be if you had one more dollar of income. Average is the taxpayer's tax on all their taxable income. What's the average they pay on their taxable income overall? And then the effective tax rate is tax they pay 
divided by all of their income, whether it's taxed or not. So I encourage you to really look at the examples in the various pages, pages 1-5, 1-6, 1-7, through, it looks like 1-8, to really um, feel comfortable with what these different types of tax rates measure. Let's take a look at an example. Bill and Mercedes have 160000 of taxable income. Remember, that's the income base that is used to determine um, um, their income tax and an additional $10,000 of non-taxable income. So that is not included on their tax return. Using the 2018 married joint tax rates. Now you will find these in Appendix D of your book. So all the way in the back, there is Appendix A, B, C, and then D. So once you find those, we could then calculate their income tax, their average tax rate, their effective tax rate, and what would happen if they had an additional 80,000 of taxable income? What is their marginal tax rate? Now you wanna make sure you know how to calculate all these, especially for your practicing graded assignments. So let's take a look. First of all, their tax due. So let's walk you through how to use this tax rate table. If your income for federal purposes is more than $100,000, you have to use a special tax rate schedule. And that's what's illustrated on page 1-6. What you will do is on the left side, it gives income levels. It starts with not over 18650 so they're speaking about taxable income. Then the next range is 18,650 to 75,900. So what we have to do is find the couple's income range, 153,100 to 233,350. So it's about the fourth one down on that married filing jointly tax rate schedule. So we're going to go across because this is the row we're going to use to calculate the tax. And the computation is kind of weird. What it says is it says take $29,752.50. Add that to the following computation. The amount of taxable income, which in their case was $160,000, in excess so above 153,100. So we subtract 153,100 from the 160,000. I actually have a calculator in front of me. And that part of their income, that part of their income, $6,900, is multiplied by the tax rate of 28%. That's their marginal tax rate right now. So you get 1932. If you add the 1932 to the 29,752.50 given, you will get their tax due of 31,684.50. So that's how much they owe. Now, how much is their average tax rate? Take the amount of tax they owe, 31,684.50 that we just calculated, and divide it by their taxable income of 160000 Because their income is taxed at different rates as it increases, and you can see that on page 1-6, the first range of income is up to 18650 Everybody's income in that range is taxed at 10%. Income in the range 18650 to 7590 if you're married filing joint, that part is taxed at 15%. So not all of their income is taxed at 28%. Some of it was taxed at 10, some of it was taxed at 15, some at 25, and now this little part is being taxed at 
So their average tax rate is that computation, or 19.8%. Their effective tax rate would be on the actual tax they paid divided by all of their income, which remember they have 10000 of non-taxable income, or $170,000. So the total, you can look at this as, as all their income. How much was their tax rate or percentage on all their income? 18.64%, or that much of all their income is paid in as taxes. And their marginal tax rate, which right now is at 28%. If they increased, okay, yeah, this one's in here. Um, their average tax rate, marginal, effective. Just checking something out really quick here. 18.64%. Bear with me. Their tax, if they had an additional amount of um, um, income. Sorry, I don't need me to be like blah, 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 blah. There we go. First, their tax due, income tax due, would be calculated as $27,079. How will we do that? Using the tax rate schedule in Appendix D, you find the tax rate schedule for married filing joints. Then you find Bill and Mercedes income, taxable income, the taxable, which was $160,000 given. So we will look. In Schedule Y1, Married Filing Joint, or Qualifying Widow or Widower, it says if taxable income is over, but not over. So depending on what their taxable income is, will determine how they compute their income tax. So it is it zero, but not over 19,050? Well, it's over 19,050. So let's go down to the next row. Is it between 19,050 but not over 77,400? No, it's over 77,400. Go down to the next row. Is it between 77,400 and 165,000? Bingo, yes, that's where it lies. So we will use the instructions for computing the tax in that row. And what the instructions say is, take 8,907, and add to that 22% of 
of the amount taxable income, which is 160,000 in this case, is above 77,400. So what you do is you take the 160, as you can see there, and subtract the 77,400. So 82,600 of their income is taxed at 22%. So multiply that by 0.22. That's 18,172. That result then is added to the 8907 fixed amount. And that will give you $27,079. So that is their actual income tax they owe on the 160000 of taxable income. Now, what is their average tax rate? Well, once you determine their income tax, divide it by their taxable income. Remember, in a progressive um, tax system, you income is taxed at a certain percentage as it increases. So, going back to your tax rate schedule, zero to nineteen thousand fifty dollars. So the first zero to nineteen thousand fifty dollars of their taxable income is only being taxed at ten percent. The amount of their taxable income between nineteen thousand fifty and seventy seven four hundred is being taxed at twelve percent. That's where the eighty nine oh seven comes from. So they're not paying twenty two percent on all of their income just the portion that's above 77,400. So what's their average tax rate? Take the 27,079 divided by their taxable income of 160, 16.92%. What is their effective tax rate? Divide their tax by all of their income, taxable and non-taxable. 27,079 Taxable was 160, 10,000 was non-taxable, so divide that by the 170. So of all of their income, they pay 15.93% in taxes. And their marginal tax rate. So what we're doing here is, remember, we're trying to figure out how much the additional amount of income of $80,000 would cause their tax rate to go up by? What percentage? So their new taxable income would no longer be 160. If we added 80, it would be at 240,000. We would then compute a new tax on 240,000 and you would use your tax rate schedule. So you can practice that. You should get $46,179. So, because you added 80,000 in additional income, how much in additional tax? Well, 46,179 divided by 27,079. $19,100 in taxes were caused by an additional 80,000 in income. So your denominator is 80,000. So you have a marginal tax rate, an additional tax rate of 23.88% because of this additional income. Okay, so that is how we um, figure out those various tax rates. Make sure you understand them. Structures. We have proportional tax rates, a flat tax. It imposes a constant tax rate throughout the tax base. Sales tax is a proportional tax rate. Some states have proportional tax rates. Pennsylvania does. It's like 3.1%. No matter how much money you make, it's taxed at 3.1%. Progressive is what we just experienced with the federal government. It imposes an in increasing marginal tax rate as the tax base increases. And you just experienced that. As the taxable income increased, that tax rate went up as well. We also have what's called regressive tax rate. It actually imposes a decreasing marginal tax rate as the tax base increases. And the, an excellent example of this is Social Security. When your wages 
go beyond a certain level in a year, you stop paying Social Security tax. So if you took all of your income um, from a job and divided it by your Social Security tax you pay, it will decrease as you go above that maximum level of, inc of, of income. So there is what a chart would look like. A proportional would be a straight line because everybody's taxed the same. A progressive, which is like our federal income tax, which is our federal income tax system, um, increases as the tax rate increases as income increases. A regressive, like the Social Security tax, decreases overall. That rate would decrease as income increases. It doesn't mean they pay less in Social Security tax. It just means because there's a point in income, I think it's 127900 this year. Once you make that much in gross pay for the year, you stop paying into the Social Security system for that year. So any amount above 127900 is not being taxed anymore. So that, that would cause your tax rate to decrease. All right. So now we're on to learning objective four. We could talk for days again about the different kind of taxes, but just to give you an overview of them. What we're focusing on for federal purposes, that's the United States government income taxes, personal income taxes. There's also business taxes, par, um, uh, corporate taxes, um, estate taxes, but just some general information, income taxes. Then we have employment and unemployment taxes. Employment taxes on the federal government side would be things like the employer matching Social Security and Medicare of the employees. The unemployment, federal unemployment tax is also another tax self-employed and, um, I'm sorry, un or, uh, employers have to pay. Self-employed people pay Social Security and Medicare as well. And you'll see in your book, it's referred to as self-employment tax. And we'll be talking about that this semester. So they not only pay an income tax on the earnings from their business, but they also pay Social Security and Medicare.
All right, guys. So when it comes to our federal taxes, income taxes, this represents approximately 58% of all of our tax revenues in the U.S. Individuals contribute 47.4, corporations 10.6, and they are levied. So individuals pay taxes, corporations do pay taxes, estates, an estate is a, um, are the assets of a deceased person. That's essentially what it is. And trust, which are special vehicles people use to protect their money. We're not going to get into that. But they all do pay taxes. Again, employment and unemployment taxes are looked at here. We've talked about those. Excise taxes. Estate and gift taxes. So I've kind of flew through these, um, talking about them. So I'm not going to re reiterate. You guys can go back and take a look. But there's sales and use taxes, um, property taxes. Oh, this is um, something I, I do need to bring up. I forgot to. Is the ad valorem tax? That's what property taxes are. Ad valorem taxes are when a tax is based on the value, the fair market value of a property. Sometimes they call them personal property. Income taxes. Some states don't have an income tax or a sales tax. So it all depends on the state you live in. Alaska, Texas, um, uh, Nevada, um, Delaware. These are just some of the states that don't have an income tax. They get their income to fund their government from other sources. There's your excise tax again. They have them at the state and local. And there's our implicit taxes. So how do we evaluate the different types of tax systems? Sufficiency. So it involves assessing the aggregate size of the tax revenues that must be generated and making sure that the tax system provides these revenues. So that's the first thing we need. We need enough money. So we need to make sure the tax system is suffice. It will, it will support what is needed. Equity. Fairness. Now, a lot of people will argue here, but the tax burden should be distributed across taxpayers. That is what it should be. Certainty. Taxpayers know they're going to have to pay it, the tax, when to pay the tax, where to pay the tax, and how to determine the tax. So that also needs to be part of the tax system. Convenience. A tax system should be designed to be collected without hardship to the taxpayer. You're going to see, I'll give you an example of that. Um, sometimes we're promised income today in the future. We, call it, we might have a contract with someone. We sold them something. We gave them our property and we said, well, pay us equally over the next three years. Well, um, 
the government will say, well, as you receive the income, pay tax on it. Not in the year you sold it. We don't want to create a hardship because you might have sold it, but you don't have the cash from that sale. So we're going to have you pay taxes as you receive the cash. It also shouldn't be hard for you to prepare your tax return or pay the money that you owe. And that's another thing with convenience. Economy. <laughs> this is funny. Should minimize the compliance and administration costs associated with the tax system. Well, that's a big screamer right now. People are always yelling that it's just too complicated. And it is. Um, so these are what your system should look like. Are, do we have all these items present? Maybe to the best of our ability, but um, some would argue that. Okay, so some more information about sufficiency. We should forecast our revenue. Static ignores how taxpayers might alter their activities in response to a tax law change. Dynamic says, hmm, let's see what, if we make this change, what's going to be the effect of the new tax law? Are we going to still be able to cre um, pull in the money we, we want? Again, equity. A tax system is considered fair or equitable if it's based on the taxpayer's ability to pay. So that's another reason, too, we'll see that progressive um, tax system. Horizontal equity. We need this kind of equity if two taxpayers in similar situations pay the same tax. Vertical equity means taxpayers with greater ability to pay tax pay more tax relative to taxpayers with lesser ability to pay. And we have a lot of argument in our country over that. So those are the items that are needed in order to have a good tax system, for lack of a better word, and how um, you can evaluate the system as to being fair. So in this chapter, we have introduced you to the concept of who cares about taxes? Why do we need them? You know, well, maybe not necessarily why, but who cares about them? Um, the, the influence they have on business, personal and political decisions. We looked at what is a tax and the general objectives of them the different tax rate structures and how we calculate a tax, the various types of federal, state, and local tax, and once again, how we evaluate tax systems. So we are all done with our lecture on Chapter 1. I encourage you to get working on your assessments and post any questions you may have.